This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, the math of you, D, four, zero. Initiate, part two. And it dives into the, the tie-in comics as well in an interesting way because there's one of the, in one of the tie-in comics, they ask Artemis to go undercover as having been arrested so that she can talk to Icicle Jr., who she knows because her dad knows Icicle, and they have a history together to talk to him to find out what's going on. And she does it, but she's angry about it. She's like, don't ever ask me to do this again. And so you, you, you see the scene, which we never see in the, in the show, because Artemis as a character never interacts directly with Icicle Jr., even though she's undercover as Tigress for a while. But there's, there's the scene you see where they're sitting down and, and they're both going to be arrested and they're, and they're having a conversation about stuff. And it's, it's again, this like, oh, well, that all makes sense, right? Everything that you set up with Artemis makes sense and plugs into this bigger world, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, amazing stuff. So how do you, so, so keep going with this triple I thing that you've got going on. But I want to talk too about like how to make that happen. You can say this is what you sure. should be doing, but how do you make it happen? Well, I think part of it is... Like you said, it's not about sitting down and writing everything that's happening in the world. Because although that does work for some people, I think what that ends up being is it ends up being, you know, if you're thinking of it, it ends up being just like the tip of the iceberg with most of it underwater and most people don't see it. The way you get to see it is sort of by painting the edges, you know? Okay. Um, If, if like, um, I've also done uh, long form improvising for a a good chunk of my life. Uh, I got involved into it. Uh, a few years back, I started doing the theater sports stuff in high school and kind of who's line things and then went into like, you know, you walk in and you create a 10 minute scene from nothing right. kind of stuff. Right. And some of the lessons you get around that is on how to paint a space, how to use objects. And never do you walk up and essentially go, this is a cup. I am picking up a cup. What you do is you interact with a space that isn't there. So you say, in your mind, you know, I'm in a kitchen. I know what this kitchen looks like. This kitchen has a countertop over there. This kitchen has a table here. And so rather than saying, I, uh, you know, hey, you're, you're as useless as this cup I'm holding right here. Yeah. And you're n- you're never saying it. What you might do is you might walk over and sit down on a chair and mime, you know, just kind of leaning on a table. But it's never the focus of what you're doing. And you might pick up a cup and kind of look at it as you're talking and you need to think, how heavy is this cup? Does this cup have water in it? Is it something that I need to interact with? So it's it's this idea of you're doing this as s- part of an action. It's never the goal. Yeah. So it's it, when you're talking about, you know, there is a lot of exposition, especially in comic book shows, because there is a deep history. But the ones who do it deftly do it through storytelling. And it's not just – although. For all I love Young Justice, you know, Dick is exposition boy for a lot of that early part of the show because he goes on his wrist computer and then he has the entire history of the world uh, up in front of him. But admittedly, that also fits with his character because Dick likes being the smartest guy in the room. Mm. So it's this idea of, okay, again, coming back to Drop Zone, okay, we know who Bane is because we've, you know, some of us have read Nightfall and nights all the other all the other nights, nights end and whatever other tie-in things but also you can just look at this and you could see okay this is a person in power this is a person who is you know a planner a manipulator this is a person who commands respect he's also very physically strong and requires a drug to do it uh but then he is immediately outclassed by this new threat and you can see that he is bitter about that and that really hits to his pride yeah uh, so he's not doing it just for money. He's doing it because he wants to take back what's his. Right. And it's, again, all of that is shown through action. Right. Rather than having it be, oh, yeah, B- Robin going, oh, yeah, Bane tangled with Batman and broke Batman's back and, you know, manipulated the criminal underworld into a mass breakout at Arkham Asylum. No, no, none of that. Yeah, none yeah. of that. Don't need it. And that's, and that's this concept we talk about of showing versus telling, right? 
Absolutely. Right. So, so when I talk about like your scenes should do, you know, more than one thing, giving information, like sitting around and going like, okay, I'm now I'm going to tell you the history of Bane. That's doing one thing. It's giving information. It's not developing character, right? It's not moving the plot forward. It has nothing to do with the plot. It's talking about a historical aspect of who Bane was, right? So none of that happens. But when you're showing it, right? So that opening scene, they don't have Robin or Batman tell us about the dangerous, you know, the dangerous aspects of Venom and that kind of stuff. We actually see it, right? And they show it and they put everybody's language in, you know, in Spanish, the local language and do subtitles Mm -hmm. and do other stuff that other shows don't take the time or effort to do. Um, absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And it, actually, as, as we're on the showing and not telling, uh, I recently rewatched one of my favorite movies, which is uh, Ronin with uh, Robert De Niro and Jean Reno uh-huh. and uh, Sean Bean and other people. And the beginning of that movie is a masterclass in show, don't tell. Have you seen the movie I'm talking about? If I have, it's been a long time. Yeah. It's like a heist movie with a spy element, and they're basically a bunch of former spies and mercenaries who are brought together to steal something okay. from a bunch of criminals. And the whole first scene is just them meeting up at a cafe in France. And, of course, it's beautifully shot in sort of the back alleys of uh, Paris. And what you see is you see, okay, a couple of people coming in and kind of nodding to the bartender and ordering a drink and sitting down. And the whole time you have Robert De Niro, who's dressed like Columbo in this like shabby little raincoat and carrying a newspaper with a little flat cap on. And you see him scope out the area, pass, look in the window, keep going. Uh, He then walks around to the alley, goes down a set of stairs, looks around, makes sure no one's around, uh, looks in the back window to make sure he's at the back of the right place, looks around the alley, walks over, finds a stack of bottle uh, crates, hides a gun under one of them, uh, walks inside, pretends to be a customer, uh, orders a glass of wine, asks where the bathroom is, walks to the back of the, the cafe, opens like opens the back door by accident, unlocks it, and looks out to the alley where he just was. And the bartender goes, oh, no, it's around the back. And so he then goes the other way. It's then revealed this is, okay, this whole scene is a bit, is where the, the baddies meet up, sorry, the, the mercenaries meet up before they go to the job. And as they walk out, one of them says, what are you doing back here? And he walks to the back, goes out the door he unlocks, walks to the bottles where he had stored things, picks up the gun he had left and puts it back in his pocket. And he says, I never walk into a place I don't know how to walk out of. And that's like the third line he's spoken in that entire 18 minute sequence. And it tells you everything you need to know about this yeah, guy. Yeah. He's, he's patient, that he's competent, that he immediately does not trust the situation, uh, that he is used to having to exit a place in a hurry, usually followed by gunfire, that he needs to set a weapon. And like just all of this is told through this incredibly long, patient shots of him setting that. And you're like, if you're in a theater and you don't know the premise of the movie, you're like, what is he doing? Yeah, yeah. But it, it's like, it tells you everything. It does. And, and, and pulling it back to Young Justice, these opening fight scenes we were talking about, like, you were talking about the car- the choreography, but also the language, right? So, you're, like you were saying, and I think you reflect on this a little bit as well. This idea that, like, okay, are you ex- like everybody else is talking about today's the day? Let's hurry up. Except Aqua Aquaman saying, "Are you excited?" And Calder's like, "I got, I'm kind of busy right now. Like, I got, I got <laughs> something that I'm doing, and then maybe we can chat about it when we get done with that." You know, like you see the character come across in the action and the interactions and how they work. Right. Um, And it so you get to see so many layers of what that is. And you do get to see like, oh, okay, well, this is Aqualad and he's got a relationship with Aquaman. And this is you get to see them all with the mentors and it sets him up. That particular kind of thing is not necessarily uncommon, but how well it was pulled off. And then finding out eventually that this weird, you know, you're like, oh, I guess it's just a superhero thing where they're all fighting ice villains. That's cute. And then you find out later down the line in Terrors that, oh, wait a minute. No, this was a thing. This wasn't just an episodic thing to introduce characters. This all had purpose, right? In addition to that, it establishes very quickly that this is a world of action. This is a world where there are lots of things going on at any one time because these fights are going on simultaneously in different locations. So rather than it being, oh, you know, two weeks before Batman and Robin have a fight with Mr. Freeze. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, one, one week before. Uh, you know, Icicle Jr. attacks and and does this stuff. So it's like, it's this idea where, again, it's that, again, to, going back to my three eyes, it's that indifference and that in- interconnectivity, which is where, yeah, stuff's happening all the time. Right. And you get that later where 
um, you know, when you've got Red Tornado introduced, he comes with his own backstory and his own set of problems, which become, you know, front and center later on when you get the other Reds turning up. Right. But even as early as that, you're like, okay, this guy's introduced. He's not there to be your mission control. Actually, that's another great example. When he's when they discover that he's making a, a humanoid android body. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, that's, a, that's Smith, a, he's like why is he's he, bad at coming up at coat names. <laughs> why is why is he he's got an apartment? He doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep. He, what does he do up there? And people are like, "Huh, that's an interesting question." And then you get up there and you realize that he's been building this thing, you know? Yeah. And even before that, you've got like even as early as the Mr. Twister episode, which um many years later I listened to the Tighten Up the Defense, which is another great podcast that everyone should listen to. Uh going through the old Teen Titans comics and the first time you see Brumstick and how incredibly weird that story is. Yeah. Um, when you see Mr. Twister, they are already questioning Red Tornado's motives because they are saying, okay, is this a test? Can we trust him? He's a robot. McGann can't read his thoughts. Uh, and already it's setting up that, okay, Red Tornado could be involved with other androids. And even that is laying the thread for the Reds later on. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is the subtle parallels between that and Superboy. Yeah. Right? Why are we talking about this with Red Tornado? And then that gut punch of a thing where where Calder tells Superboy, who's bent out of shape because, you know, McGann had gotten hurt in this whole thing. And like, I'm going to take out my vengeance on Red Tornado. It was clearly his fault. And Calder's basically like... um, Perhaps he didn't have control over his actions. Perhaps he may have been programmed to be a weapon in some way. And oof, it's like, oh, hey, there's your personality. Let's just punch you in that for a minute. Like this is, you know. So, yeah. So, and I love this this idea you're talking about, about painting around the edges. So, it's basically the idea of in, in art where you're talking about the void, right? What the negative space, thank you. I'm not an artist. I knew the idea, but not the name. So the negative space, like what isn't being being painted? Like what um I made this reference on the show. Uh Mary Robinette Cowell is a is 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 a wonderful author. She also happens to be a professional puppet puppeteer. Um and so one of the things that she talked about in writing and puppeteering, which is her, you know, <laughs> mishmash of her own expertise, which I think is fantastic is that the puppet has no expressions. And so you express, you have to express what the puppet is thinking about by what the puppet is looking at, right? Because otherwise there's no, it's, it, it reminded me of what you were talking, not that you're a puppet, but not, it reminded me that <laughs> of what you were talking about, like, oh, I'm going to sit at this imaginary table and pick up this imaginary cup and I'm, I'm contemplating this cup. Like people mm. can picture what that is and what you're doing and, and it makes them think like, okay, well, what's going on in his head? kind of a thing, right? So it's painting around yeah. the edges. If the puppet's not listening, or, or it is listening, but it's looking at something else, or its attention gets veered away, you're painting around it and giving the opportunity for questions to be asked that are hopefully good, appropriate questions like, oh, where is this leading me? You're leading your reader, your watcher, your player in a particular direction, or seeing if they want to go in that direction, right, to discover these things. And you've actually reminded me in talking about the puppet thing, it's something that I actually love in quite a few sort of very excellent uh, actors, especially comedic actors. And you see this in people like Andre Brower, and you see it in people like Nick Offerman, uh, which is the value of stillness and yeah. the idea that anything that you like, you're talking about your puppet, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not just it, the where the puppet is looking, or it's not just uh, that the puppet is listening but not looking. It's also how the how the puppet's body posture is, how how it is relation how it was before, and so every it's it's this thing. And again, I'm going to get into some deep improv stuff, so I apologize Did, if people can stay. No, that. no, no, dive uh, in. This is what we're here for. You're in uh, duration of shape. Okay, duration of shape is you are doing a thing and holding a position, and how long you have been holding that position and what that position is informs your partner of what you're feeling and what you're thinking, and so you can be in duration of shape until you feel the need to change. Yeah. And when you change, it needs to be for a reason. It needs to be because you felt something. Yeah. And so you'll see that in even ca funny characters like Ron Swanson. Ron Swanson is incredibly funny, not just for the things he says, but because he is this gl still glowering force in the midst of all these wacky characters. And when Ron moves or says something or does something, it has import because he has not blinked up until that point. Right. 
And when he does, it's because he felt something and he wanted to do something. Uh, Andre Brower on Brooklyn Nine-Nine does the same thing to great effect. Uh, he's Captain Holt. Yeah. There's no, there's none of this wasted movement thing. Like Jason Spizak talked about, he's a very like active talker and he had to be talked down when he was doing theater. Don't just <laughs> wave your hands around. Like every motion has to have a purpose, right? Um, another analogy I want to bring up is this idea of, you know, the difference between a novel that's 800 pages and a novel that mm-hmm. was 800 pages and is now 200 pages uh, yeah. is that the extra 600 pages are still in the 200 pages, yeah, right? It's that tip of the iceberg thing again. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that painting around it. It's, the, it's the, the, the focusing on the through line, but allowing the rest of the things to exist in the space at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You're much better uh, in describing a character instead of saying this character has blonde hair. This pair character has slightly watery eyes. This character uh, is a bit skinny, but not in a fashionable way. So like any any of that stuff, that's telling. What you might see is you might see how other people react to them or a movement they do when they enter a room. Right. And that tells you more. Like if someone, like for example, let's talk about, the, you know, as me, myself, as someone who is very frizzy haired and has a big mop of curly hair, rather than saying Lucas has curly hair, if you, for example, were writing this scene of this morning and you start at the Skype call, you would have seen me quickly smooth my hair behind my ears and like adjust my headphones yeah. so that it was not a massive cloud behind me looking like a question mark. <laughs> Describing that action of me adjusting my headphones and moving my hair behind my head tells you more about me than just saying, hey, Lucas has curly hair. Right, exactly. And this happens in a book. It's, it's classic, you know, beginning writer stuff where you're like, there's always the 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 mirror in the hallway scene where she... He he looked at his mop of curly hair. <laughs> you know, I mean, I totally did this when I was in creative writing too. It's just a thing, yep, right? Yep. And and it happens in role playing games too, and other things where you're talking about the surface aspects of a character. And though some of those things may be important, all of those things are not important. In fact, maybe none of them are important. Not for the moment that you're in. Just what is the thing that exhibits the personality? And again, with a character that you're writing or a character that you're showing. When you when the character is talking about something, if it's familiar to them, they're not going to care. If it's exactly. unfamiliar to them, that's what's going to draw their attention. And what's unfamiliar in a same situation between, say, yourself and myself, what's unfamiliar will be different and will inform their personalities, right? Completely. And it's something where I talk about it a little bit on uh, on the math view, which is where the people I find who b- become the guest the best guests are the people who have an idea of how to tell the story of themselves to someone else. And that's, mm-hmm. it's a talent that you has to be nurtured because uh, the example I always give is if I'm telling myself the story of my parents' divorce when I was 10, yeah, I don't ever need to give myself context because I was there. I lived it. I knew <laughs> right. what I was okay, feeling yes, at fair. the time. Right. Yeah. So if I'm telling someone, if I told them the the story, the way I think of that story, it would make no sense to them. Yeah. So what I need to do is I need to say, okay, I will preface this by saying that this was how we got here. This is where we were at the time. This is how my dad's job was going. This is how my mom was doing in relation to X, Y, Z. And this is what led to their divorce. So, you know, when you explain something, it's like, can you get that story across in those beats the context is there for you but you know what beats are important to to communicate that right uh and it's like talking about the mirror scene and it's again this is a line where and i am not condoning this line this is merely a line that i read and it told me exactly what i needed to know about the viewpoint of this character and the world that it was in i even forget where it's from it says she was attractive in a way that other women would say she was attractive in an obvious way right and thing is, that's not a viewpoint I endorse, but that tells you exactly everything you need to know about how this woman is viewed by other people right. and how she views herself and how in interaction with other people would – how that would play out. Right. And so that one line, for all that it you know condones to a kind of a crappy viewpoint. Yeah, I hear uh, what you're saying. It, it is a sentence that, that does a lot of lifting. Uh, there's, a, there's another great line that always jumps out at me, um, Douglas Adams in some of the opening chapters of uh, mm-hmm. Hitchhiker's Guide. The starships hung in the sky exactly the way that bricks don't. I had to put the book down. 
<laughs> and I, I and was one like of those garden path sentences where it's you're going, you're going, you're going, and then yep, off to the side, yep. and you're just like, oh, that actually is reprogramming my brain a little bit. Like this idea of what it isn't or what it does it isn't as much of what it is. Sometimes it's about what it isn't or how it's perceived by someone else, right? Like it's that good kind of absurdity right. because. The context of thinking about a brick hanging in the sky tells you exactly how wrong the spaceship being there right. is. Right, and the important aspect isn't what the space starship looked like. The important aspect is how did it make you feel, <laughs> right? Yep. And, and yep. it's the same kind of thing. And and so let's talk about this from a worldview standpoint. Because mm. so when we were developing Descent into Midnight, and in, in into Descent into Midnight, every every table of characters is creating not just their own characters, but the world that they're going to play in at the same time. And so we started off with asking questions as part of the first session, you're creating your characters in the world. So there were questions and there were things like, tell me about a distinguishing, uh, um, God, what, what was the question? Tell me about a landmark or district in the city, right? Oh, that's a good tell one. me what a, a non sentient, uh, non sapient aquatic creature. That's part of the ecology, Right. Tell me about a, a an event like a holiday or something that happened for the city, right? Now, those are great things. But what nailed me was when Richard Kreutz Landry, one of our designers, added the, the last question. And the last question was, what do the people of the city take for granted? Oh, that's a good question. And, and it ties directly into the example that you gave, which is this brilliant breakdown of like all of the stuff that's happening that people just take for granted. And like electricity for us, like we're talking across the world to each other right now and we just take it for granted. And if when there's no electricity yeah. in this house or I lose the Internet, ah, you know, like I don't know what to do. <laughs> I got to get it fixed before I can do anything because my life is wrapped around the thing. I think the greatest expression of that feeling is the feeling when you've got a touchscreen device and it decides to stop working and you end there end up sitting there poking at this glass brick that's in your hand right. that no longer has a meaning or value because it does not work right and i think about this when we're talking when i'm when i'm thinking about things like like a a science fiction setting so like star trek or you know atlantis mm -hmm. or you know stargate or whatever it happens to be where they go to some other world and i'm like okay well there's all this technology around but do you even know it's technology like if if everything is if everything is stored digitally and it requires some power source that maybe isn't electricity or something you don't understand, how could you even know that it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't just a mirror, <laughs> right? Like a literal you know an iPad looking like a little black mirror, you know? Like how would mm -hmm. you even know any of that? And would you be able to do anything archaeologically or anthropo anthropologically to be able to research this culture if there's no actual photos on a wall? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's so interesting to me to be able to do that. Now, in Star Trek, they're like, oh, we've adapted our power source. And I'm like, really? Because I can't adapt my power source from a PC to my Mac. So, like, I don't <laughs> I don't know how you even managed to pull that off. I guess replicators, but... It's magic wand. Right. But, but again, this thing where there's stuff that gets taken for granted is this thing you were talking about at the beginning about what's happening in the world around you that has that... What was the word? I'm sorry. The word you were using, the... Um, inertia? Uh, not inertia. The... What were the three words again? Inertia? Uh, inertia, indifference, and integration. Indifference. The world is indifferent to what's going on, but also the people in the world are indifferent to certain aspects of things that are happening that they're taking for granted. And inevitably, I'd say 80% of the one-shots I've run with Descent into mm -hmm. Midnight, the thing they took for granted triggers the inciting incident because it's the easiest of thing to go for. But we don't usually think of worlds. We're like, oh, what is it? What's happening in the world? What do things look like? Right? What do things... You know, that kind of stuff. But if you describe a weird looking horse, you're describing it to the reader. If you have an elf who's reading, right, riding <laughs> this horse that looks weird to them, yeah. they don't care. It doesn't, it's a daily thing to them. So they wouldn't be like mu I'm musing. Just, was just, uh, sorry, I laughed because I was just thinking like, like reading a book and just hearing, hey, look at that weird looking horse. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Our, the the uh, horses sorry. on our world that all look like chickens. You know, mm -hmm. it's weird Calling that they don't spear. look like equine horses from this planet Earth that we've never heard of, right? So you, which is a nice segue to talk about Usagi Yojimbo in a second. Oh yeah, no, sentence. that was pretty much it. You, I think I got my point across. So, okay. so um, yeah, let's talk Usagi. 
Okay, because the two examples that I had in my head that do this really, really well, this interconnectivity and this indifference and this inertia are The Legend of Korra, specifically more than Avatar, yeah. because it deals with the time jump. And in that time jump, when you arrive at that yes. city, you learn so much. Everything from uh, firebenders using lightning to power the lights and the idea that lightning was an incredibly elite technique taught only to the royal family of the firebending nation. 70 years and now before. Is bec- yeah. Yeah. And now is so commonplace that it is used to literally run streetlights in a night noodle market. And, and to be honest, that's perfectly reflective of things like the fact that we have salt and pepper sitting on our tables, yeah. right? This thing that used to be yeah. more worth more than gold pepper is now is mm-hmm. now you can't even think about cooking anything without it. Yeah, I have three kinds of salt in my cupboard right now. I have pink Himalayan salt, I have regular iodized salt, and I have some uh, some black salt that I bought on a whim because it was on sale to $3, and it's neat because you can see it when you put it into something like scrambled eggs, so you know how much you've put oh, in. Oh, interesting. Super useful. Um, uh, and so it's, yeah, it's this idea where what do you take for granted? Well, in Korra at the time, uh, the people in the city take for granted that they have, for example, automobiles and they have electric lights yeah. uh, and they have, you know, spectacles where the ancient fighting arts of bending are now the equivalent of Monday Night Football. Right, right. And so and then you have Cora as someone who has existed entirely in um, enclosed spaces as she trained to be the avatar stepping in and through her, her, her as a viewpoint character we get to be introduced to this world that is different from the one we left last time. Yeah. And the reason I mentioned Usagi Yojimbo, uh, I think one, you need, I think, amazing. I think you need to talk about what that is. Cause I'm sure not all of our listeners know what Usagi is. All right. So you see something like 30 years ago or more, uh, Stan Sakai is an incredibly gifted man decided to create a comic series about a masterless samurai who grew up learning swordplay from a hermit uh, and joined a noble lord who was then killed, and he became a masterless samurai, wandering the world and getting into scrapes and adventures and learning stuff about himself and about the world in general and trying to protect the innocent. Except for it's a world of funny animals. Usagi is a rabbit, as you might have guessed from his name. His name is Miyamoto Usagi. And, and he is Usagi a rabbit is Roman. Japanese for rabbit. <laughs> Yes, I was about to say, <laughs> you a little bilingual bonus there. Uh, and other people are cats, and other people are dogs, and, and his best friend is Jen, who is a, a really grumpy rhino bounty hunter, and Jen's the best. Mm-hmm. I love him. Um, and uh, he is friends with a fox, and uh, like all of these things, and none of that detracts from the epic scale and mm-hmm. uh, both serious and humorous import of these incredible stories. It also helps that Stan Sakai is an incredible illustrator. Absolutely. The thing about Yusagi as a, as a comic series, I am also a huge fan. I have collected many, many comics in my day, but the only comic series out of, I don't know, hundreds, thousands I've, I've been exposed to that I have gone back to search and find all of the previous stories of is Yusagi Yojimbo. It's clean. It's straightforward. There's no fat on these stories. It is beautiful and clear and emotional. Amazing, amazing storytelling. Yeah. And... Like I um, had read Grass Cutter before, which is the the landmark Usagi Yojimbo yeah. story. It's the big one. Uh, there's a reason it's in the top five of uh, War Rocket Ajax's every story ever, and it's stayed there for a long time because it is. It starts with the creation of the gods, which leads to the creation of smaller gods named Kami, who then create a sword, and that sword is then given to the emperor. That's the prologue. Yeah. And it's massive and beautiful and in different art styles. I mean, every panel of Usagi Yojimbo is, like you said, it's clean and beautiful. And I've like taken screenshots from my iPad and done the equivalent of rolling on the floor, pounding my fists on Twitter, just being like, look at this thing. Look how beautiful yep. this thing is. You have the mountains and you have the valley and you have the trees and you have the road. And in the foreground, you have your characters and your characters are doing something and your characters are interacting like it's like he's playing the flute or he's, you know, running running a stick along a fence or doing something. And yep. you have all of that in perfect relief in this vertical panel, which is, of course, reminiscent of traditional Japanese uh, panels yep. and art. And and while it looks like a static panel, every piece of that panel is telling setting and story and moving plot forward and character development, like all of it from no words being presented on a page. Yeah. Did you see um, – I tweeted this the other day. It's just a random page that I found in the middle of uh, Usagi Ujimbo Saga Volume 1. And it was him coming to a crossroads mm-hmm. and looking left and looking right and going, 
oh, well, you know, when both paths are the same, I suppose it's to the gods to disguise. And he picks up a stick and he throws the stick up in the air and the stick goes duh, 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 and lands to the left and he goes left. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's one page. Mm -hmm. And it may be one of the most perfect pages I have ever seen. <laughs> and it sounds that I think, I think the draw here, it may sound as we're describing it, is very simplistic. Oh, it had mountains and characters in the foreground and blah, 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 blah. But it, it's that beauty of a lot of um, historical Japanese art. Again, it's not, it's not as much what's on the page as what's not on the page or what is chosen to be looked at and viewed in a particular scene. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'll talk about Usagi all day. I, I'd probably do a podcast on Usagi to be perfectly honest, because it could, it yeah. could hold up absolutely to a whelm style deep dive, but, but let, let's focus. And talking about what, about what it takes for granted though, just to, to finish mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. point, what Usagi takes for granted is that it is a bunch of funny animals. And instead of having rabbits or deer, it has tokage, which are sort of sauropod lizards that come up to your knee. And the kind of setting of this world as, oh, this is a world of funny animals, but there is also Imperial Japan, and there is also a lot of the same clans and mm -hmm. dynasties that would have been in real life, uh, and the same legends and gods and such. And so, when, and, for and example, classic, classic Japanese, you know, copy and all these classic, you know, Japanese mythological creatures that he doesn't run into often, but he runs into often enough where he's like, hmm. Is yeah, this, I know what you is, are, and I can fight you. I think I know you're not what I, th you know. It, it, so it's it's not something that's like it's not like Monster of the Week or something, right? It's one of mm -hmm. these things that when he runs into it, it's actually pretty scary and horrifying, right? Because it doesn't yeah, it's happen. Like this often. person who has who has brought him in and has given him hospitality, him and his friend, and but they're acting a little shifty. And your first thought is, oh, are they like a spy? Are they going to tell where he is to his enemies, right. or are they going to try and attack him? And then. They turn into like a cat monster, which uh oh yeah, I'm gonna try forget the name, which was uh, it was something like uh, it was an obaneko or something to that effect, where it's a ghost cat, which is a, a haunting, a localized haunting yeah. of someone who has become a hermit and then died and become a cat. Like it's it's a legend, and he sees it and he's terrified, but he names it as what it is, and then can immediately fight yeah. it. Because, like you said, it's a legend, and he's so it's this. All of that is layered in. Yeah, and oftentimes there's little subtle things that you, when you go back to read the story, you can see the hint thing that Yusagi saw that made it different than what it should have been, and uh, mm. amazing. And and the fact that it's all plugged into some historical context and and, and myth and legend, um, along with reality and classism and social strata within uh, the feudal Japanese world, and uh, stuff between the shogunate and the lords, and it's. Yeah, it's it's incredibly deftly done. Uh, yeah, there ain't there ain't a rum one in there. No, no, not a, you can not literally enough. pick it up from wherever and just go because you, you'll get a good one. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so how do you think? Do you think this is part of what Stan has put together here? This this idea of painting around the edges about like, okay, Usagi is a, a fascinating to me and, and a very deep character where at first you don't think that he might be um, very complex, particularly over the decades he's been written. Um, but when you see him, he's easy to grasp. Yusagi Yojimbo, rabbit, bodyguard, very straightforward concept. This is what he's doing, right? And so you can follow him on these adventures. And But like Neil Gaiman's um, Sandman, sometimes Yusagi is the center of the story. And sometimes Yusagi is peripheral to the story and happens to be walking into the story in a way that you're like you're talking about he move he he walks into a village and in that village there has been a historical bunch of you know nonsense going on that 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 he's walked into and either gets pulled into or volunteers to be a part of yeah and often when he volunteers it is out of a sense of character because usagi is a character who in the best interpretation of bushido is a person who does the right thing and he does it without thinking. Yeah. Occasion and where you only occasionally get stories where he is wrought with what to do, where he is like, I, I don't know what will be the right course of action. He reacts to the best interest of his care of other people. So often he will get involved in a scuffle with, you know, random drunks who are hassling an innkeeper. Yeah. Because, hey, don't do that. Don't be a bully. And he will walk in and he will just house these guys and send them running. But of course, they will tell their boss, who is actually trying to get the innkeeper's land right. from him so he can then sell it off to some people right. who want to, you know, make a factory or uh, in the, you know. And what's, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm, because when you, when you look at Shaggy, like you, when you say them, like, oh, this character always does what's right. Okay. You see this in a story, mm -hmm. you see this in something else, and you're pretty sure he's going to win because he's also got 
uh, the sword fighting skills that can't be matched. So you're like, is he Mary Sue? Is he like Superman, Captain America? But he's not. And what's interesting to me is not only is he not quite fit into that category, but even if he did, these stories, you see so much humanity that occurs around Usagi, where Usagi is is kind of a rock in many cases. Um, not all the cases, but in, in many cases, where you're seeing humanity happen as a reflection of life around him in some way that feels like you're getting a deep view, view of things. And where like um, where Jeff Stormer came on the show and was talking about Superman and was saying like the best Superman stories aren't about his powers or the fact that he's going to win the day. The best Superman stories are about will his morals remain intact when he comes out the other side of the story. And some of Yusagi's stories, if not, uh, I'd say over half, at least these stories have to do with this idea of like, will what you saw, what is Yusagi doing? Why is he doing it? What obligations is he choosing to make and not make? And will he turn on an obligation? Because that's terrible for him. Right. And Mm -hmm. once he finds out more information and blah, blah, blah. So it becomes this subtle, beautifully, like you're saying, trimmed, uh, complex story in its simplicity almost. Yeah. And it's, there's a couple of particular stories where that happens. I mean, you like Grasscutter, which I mentioned before, which is the, this great epic about a, a, an imperial sword, which is one of the, the great, uh, imperial objects of Japan. And this idea that it had been lost for centuries and it's found again. And it's uh, by a, an evil witch who is controlling crabs who have the souls of dead soldiers because, hey, Usagi Jimbo right. uh, uses it to uh, pull it up onto the, the beach. And Usagi happens to be walking by in that moment, picks it up and finds it, is immediately ta- attacked by bandits and has to use it to fight them off and kind of goes, oh, this is weird. Um, anyway, I'll take it with me, which then causes at least four different factions to then immediately pivot and go after Mm -hmm. him while fighting each other. And throughout that story, he starts off as this kind of almost the fool or kind of the, you know, the, the stick being thrown around on the waves of change because these people just keep attacking him and he does not know why. But of course, because he's him, he is like, all right, you're attacking me. I'm going to defend myself. But what he finds is that, okay, if I take this sword to one of the Lords, they could use it to, you know, to cement their power. They could use it to overthrow the current ruling class. If I bring it to the emperor, it will bring back the times of the empire. What's actually going to be the best thing in this scenario? Because I could do either very easily, and it would be easy for me because it would get this burden off of me. But I need to make sure that what I do is the right thing, and the pressures continue to mount that he has to make a decision. And of course... Being Usagi, he takes uh, to steal a line from, uh, he's from yeah, sorry, from the beginning of Avatar. He takes the position of ne- of neutral Jing, which is that he does he goes neither forward nor backward, and he steps out of the situation. Yeah, and, and to, instead return initially um, gives it to a priest who then hides it again because it is too powerful. Here's a, here's another thing that's interesting that I think is it ties into this story is just the name of the sword. So you're talking about an epic in, in the context of Usagi, in which there's not really magical weapons. That's not really a thing. There are some kind of spellcasters. There's these ghosts. He has this particularly horrifying and wonderful villain that thinks he's a hero. Jay, um, there's so oh, who's the he's, oh, so he's scary the best and terrifying. And, and so you have this kind of supernatural aspect, but it's not like there's like Mjolnir laying around or something, right? Mm. So you yeah. have this epic sword called Grass Cutter. Like you're like, wait, Mm -hmm. there's an epic sword and the thing is grass cutter. But when you find out the story of why it got that name and how it got that name and and it's so rich to it, it it made me when I first heard it, I'm like, well, this doesn't sound like an epic weapon. But they just because Stan doesn't pull out of the cliche trunk, right? He he's not gonna be like, oh, it's you know, you know, the Jade Storm or whatever. He's gonna be like, let's what is the richness in the history? What is this thing we're talking about where there was a world happening and a thing happening, and sometimes you don't understand why a thing is named a particular way or or became a particular way and you take it for granted. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even just explaining how the sword came to be you have to start with the creation of the world. Right. And going from that broad pyramid to a point, <laughs> point, because it's a sword. Yes, it's, um, and, but I'm bummed. and you had, you know, you have the creation of gods and you have lesser gods and you finally get to, I never know how to say this. It's uh, Susanna O. 
uh, I never know how to say it. It's one of the storm gods who is also in this mythology, a person. And he gets into a battle and his enemies are cowardly and they use flaming arrows on a grass plain mm -hmm. to hem him in. And when he, and then they think, okay, he's trapped. He will either die by fire or will be forced into fighting us and then we'll kill him with our overwhelming numbers. And what he does is he spins and he cuts the grass. Yeah. And as he cuts he the grass, he makes a fire break. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he basically makes a fire break and that blow, and he, it also creates a wind because that's part of his power set. Uh, and it blows the fire back into his enemies and they are undone by their own cowardly trick. Right. And so. It becomes the, the cutter of grass, and so this yeah. I, this idea that that when you when you walk into a situation, the other thing from a storytelling perspective is this idea that oh well, you saw you just walked into this situation. That's just mm. you can have a Deus Ex Machina, not Deus Ex Machina, but you can have a random event occur to get someone mm. into trouble. You should not have a random event occur to get someone out of trouble, and unless, exactly. unless there is some like ridiculous reason why that is actually going to work you shouldn't do that now getting now this happens with like yusagi quite a bit he walks into a situation this is what happens and then but the choice of what to do is entirely of the agency of the person that's a bit of an aside but so let's let's talk a little bit let's, let's try and wrap up this conversation about about um living worlds a little bit here and bring mm -hmm. it back to young justice and we'll we'll bookend it with that Okay. How do you think specifically that they managed to pull off a living, aside from the fact that DC Comics has a rich history, not everything in Young Justice, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of things that aren't in the comic history of this world, meaning that they had to create things like Beast Boy's origin is not in the comics what it was in mm. the show. So... Um, or Miss Martian having a relationship with Superboy or even Wally and Artemis together. None of that's happened in the comics. So, so how do you feel like they created this living world or, or what, what techniques might they have used? Okay. Well, I think I'm going to speak specifically to the time skip because I think it's the easiest example okay, that's a of great some idea. of that inertia that we've been talking about. Right. And I've, I spoke before on Megan's episode. I am normally not a fan of time skips. I think they are, they, or rather they have been used previously as a lazy way to encourage characterization without doing the work. And it's yes. also a way to artificially extend tension because you can go from characters that you're familiar with and then suddenly they're unfamiliar and you get to spend five issues or five episodes working out why before it's revealed. Yes. And so it's, a situation where in the hands of a less talented writer is a real easy shortcut to be like, oh, I've got this nice character. I want to make him mean and I can't work out how. I'm just going to make him mean. And then that gives me a four or five episode buffer to actually come up with the reason. Yes. And it's like that's that's lazy and that's cheap. It's it's not conscious creation. <laughs> Exactly. And it, I honestly, like when we were talking before about, uh, you know, about Ronin and about uh, Usagi and this idea, I, I almost said conscious creation again. I'm like, but that's the title of his episode of The Math of You. We can't say that again. <laughs> yes, we can. Um, sure, we'll call back. Yes, Go listen can. to that episode right. too. Yeah. Uh, and the thing with it, it's that, you know, it's that stillness where a small movement makes change. And so when you talk about a time skip in Young Justice, what you get is you get a lot of inertia because the bed has been made so thoroughly. And so when, for example, you go to school with uh, with McGann and Connor, you get to meet Mel Duncan. You get to meet Barbara Gordon. You get to see that Dick Grayson's a mathlete on the wall. Right. You know, and so when uh, you get to see that their team is called the Bumblebees and Bumblebee is there. Right, right. So, and so for people who are familiar their little nods, right? You know, you've got, uh, was it Wendy, Wendy and Marvin? Wendy and Marvin from Super Friends, yeah. Yeah. And so you've got all of that. And it could just be set dressing. It could just be a little tip of the hat to the person who knows the history. But of course it's not. This is Young Justice. Come on. Mm -hmm. So when you get a time skip, you don't need to say why Barbara Gordon is Batgirl because Barbara Gordon is Batgirl. Right, right. And so... Because that has been laid so deeply in the foundations and it has been planned for so long in advance that when it happens, it's the closing of a circle. It's not a, you know, a whack-a-mole popping up out of nowhere. Right. And even, even like Legan being in, being in the episode of downtime where, you know, right. you're, you're going by and there's his jerk self in the, in the sorcery class that Mara's teaching. Mm -hmm. 
And it's and then later he comes back, and then if you remember, you go, oh yeah, I remember that jerk. There's no way you can remember. You're only gonna know it when you rewatch it again because you're just like, mm-hmm. oh, was that what? Um, but to continue the Barbara Gordon thing, we now know we have strong evidence to suggest that mm-hmm. not only do we jump from Barbara to Batgirl, we're now jumping from Batgirl to Oracle, mm-hmm. and it opens questions. A lot of questions as to what what Worrying w- questions. what we're going to see about Oracle, because Oracle as as a, a character that has a disability, I love her, and she also came into her own instead of being a not a, a reflection or a shadow of Batman or even Nightwing, and she became her own powerful one of the I think most powerful characters in the DC universe in my opinion, but her origin story is full of unfortunate situations. It is problematic as it's heck. problematic is the word yeah so so where are they going to take it uh, you know are they going to take it and how they're going to do that but but what doesn't jump into my mind is like oh that's definitely barbara's voice and it's definitely oracle this is really cool i want to see what they do those are the questions not like like i trust them at this point to be able to figure that out and here's what we talk about when we talk about an interconnected world okay that is using the best aspects of the inertia of a shared universe they may not need to explain why Barbara Gordon is Oracle because we know. And what, like, if they explain it, it will be because there is a reason to explain it to give more depth to that right. character. It's not going to be because, hey, uh, this episode we're doing Killing Joke because I hope not. No, no, but I can't imagine they would. I hope not. But the thing is, it's one of those things where you, it's like you can use all of this momentum. Mm-hmm. that this character has and we know that barbara gordon goes from jim gordon's daughter to batgirl to oracle right and <laughs> back to batgirl but um i know yeah, i know yeah. I'm, we're not getting into that no, if no. you go on for days it's, but- it's okay it's okay but so i think i think the thing that we need to, to if we're going to be talking to people being creators themselves about a takeaway is sure you don't and correct me or add to it if you need if you want to please this idea that when you introduce a character or idea or situation or a city or a place or a world, you don't need to dump a whole bunch of information on people. Let let the information be revealed. Having said that, you can't have a character suddenly reveal at the end of a story that they've really been a martial arts master the whole time. You really need to do this thing about this this rule of three, this this idea of introducing something or leading into it or leaving breadcrumbs toward the thing for the reveal at the end and slowly unfolding these things like mm-hmm. like a flower, right? Like unfolding <laughs> yeah. this thing until you see the, the full beauty instead of describing the thing in detail, right? Does that, does that make sense? Even, even if you're talking about a city or a, or a world that you're creating. Yeah. There's, uh, have you read The Lies of Locke Lamora? Uh, yeah, I have. It's oh, great. That's, that's a really good example of that because you have, again, this, you know, a gr- an orphan coming into a group of orphans like Oliver Twist. Yep. And, you know, being a thief. And then you establish how he's different. And then you establish how, <laughs> what flaws he has, which mostly is overconfidence. He's very, very good, but he thinks he's perfect. Yep. And and then from there, you describe the city through these cons he is doing as an adult with his friends. And you build in certain tropes and patterns of behavior and like you said you do them once to establish them do them second time to cement them and the third time is a subversion and when that subversion comes because at first you see it coming and you go okay i know what's going to happen here and they swerve it at the end because they know you know it's coming i now refer Again, i now refer to it as the classic dr fate yeah because it's it's wally it's artemis i mean so it's wally it's uh it's calder and then mm-hmm. you think it's going to be Zatanna, and it turns out to be Zatara, right? Yeah, exactly. So, That's a really good comparison. Yes. And so I, th- I think with Young Justice, the other thing is that it really does the best of a lot of these series of understanding what it is to be what is considered a low-level superhero in a world that's full of superheroes. Right. Uh, early episode, Early issues of Invincible do this really well. Uh, later it kind of loses its way but this idea that okay it's one thing to talk about how you or i would deal with getting superpowers in this our real world right it's another thing to talk about how one would deal with getting superpowers in a world where there is no heroic fiction where there's no template to follow it's a completely different thing to say 
all right, there are established heroes. Superman exists. Martian Manhunter exists. Batman exists. The Justice League is a massive uh, world-spanning team that not just has a satellite, but has a public face and a private face uh, and has, you know, dozens and dozens of enemy teams and supervillains, all with their own histories and backstories. And what it would be to be first a young hero and then a uh, an emerging adolescent to adult hero in those situations because every time that you see the team get involved in stuff it's stepping into that established situation uh, oh, why wasn't this handled by the league oh superman's dealing with a threat off world right now yeah and while it can seem like a way of just writing them out it's also saying yeah like with those ice villains at the beginning of the first episode stuff is happening all the time yep absolutely i agree 100 percent all right. Well, I think we could keep this conversation going on for a really long time. Um, we easily I, could. I'm going to ask you to put uh, some links into our uh, notes here for the show notes for all of the references you made today, <laughs> including Young Justice, or including uh, Yosagi Ojimbo. Um, I will, yeah. So uh, thanks so much for coming on our show uh, and letting us return the favor. It was fantastic. Um, where can people find you out on Earth Prime? All right. So if you want to find my podcast, I've actually just relocated it to Pippa.io, which is a great podcasting service because it also lets me uh, make transcripts of my episode, which is great for accessibility. Uh, I was That was what, like the major driving force to get me to switch from Squarespace over to Pippa. Uh, so you can go to themathofyou.com and that will take you to the show. Uh, it will also, in each of the episodes, I've got my recipes that I've made up. I've got a link to a playlist, which is all of the music I've chosen for the episode going all the way back to episode one. It's We're a fantastic episode... playlist. I listen to it all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's, it's, a, it's a little all over the place because people have different tastes, but you're always going to find something it's new. kind of what I like uh, about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you wanted to follow the show on Twitter, it's just The Math of You. Uh, normally, I will post, you know, pictures of the drinks that I've made. I will post links to other work that the creators have done that I interview uh, as well as when a new episode goes live. If you want to follow my wacky adventures, I'm at Lokified, L-O-K-I-F-I-E-D, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, a lot of my Instagram is pictures of my baby, uh, or rather toddler now, uh, and uh, also uh, a bunch of local wrestling shows that I go to, and I bring film cameras to it uh, and document it old school, so um, look out for that. And, uh, oh, I didn't mention, we didn't even talk about it. I'm, I'm a photographer. I do a lot of analog photography with stuff like, you know, double exposures and, um, you know, frame splitting and fun experiments like that. So if that's your bag, come and check it out. And yeah, yeah my Twitter, uh, you'll find recently because I bought 30 volumes of Usagi Yojimbo on Comixology, it's going to evolve a lot of screenshots from an iPad and me howling on the floor, kicking myself going, oh my God, this is just so good. I have no uh, issue with boosting the signal on Usagi Yojimbo. Absolutely. So yeah, you can find my stuff there. Uh, I also do a thing called cursive tweets every now and again, mostly when I'm bored in the office, uh, where uh, I'll do like a half an hour period where anyone who tweets at me, I will pick a random tweet of theirs and I will write it out in calligraphic cursive. cursive. I'll say it again, calligraphic cursive. <laughs> uh, and that's always fun. That's always a blast to do. Uh, and I love seeing people signal boost that as well. Oh, I didn't even know that. I'm doing that totally. Uh, and yeah. thanks for, to everyone else for sharing some time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, our website, crashingthemode.com, our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And of course, you can also find us on YouTube, uh, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio as well. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings really do help others find the show. If you leave us a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to track those down. And even though Season 3 is coming soon, within months, we hope, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology to get uh, yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always... Stay warmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. 
as such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.